Service Lab is a community of service design doers and the service design curious. We meet up every few months to share our learnings with each other. So hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Our today's topic is stories of intended and unintended consequences of design. We will hear from different speakers who will share stories of consequences of designing or not designing these consequences for climate, community engagement, reason leaders pathways, trauma-informed assessment, and digital services. They will also tell us about tools and methods on how to foresee positive consequences and avoid negative ones. Quick introduction of Service Lab. If you joined us uh, in the first time, Service Lab is a bi-monthly event for service designers and service design curious. We've had events about policy design, behavioral and inclusive design, and uh, this is a very informal event. We welcome everyone, whatever you're doing, so feel free to have your camera on or off. If you are resting after a working day, having a dinner, or if you have a kid or a cat with you. We are trying to make the event as inclusive and accessible as possible. So if you have a feedback on how to make it better, please reach out. Uh, we would be happy to hear your feedback and make everything that we can. A quick introduction to the team. Charlie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Charlie Pothicry. I'm a Service Lab co-organizer. My preferred pronouns are she, her. I am sat in a white room with a few plants behind me. I am white with long brown hair and I've got bright yellow earrings on. Hi there, I'm Atla, a service designer, she, her. I'm a blonde woman with a colorful shirt uh, with a plant in the background sitting in my living room and looking forward to hear the speakers speaking tonight. Great, thank you, Atla. We also have Rupert, who started this event series with Jenny many years ago. He still has the service lab in the background, but he's not here today. My name is Katrina. My pronouns is she, her. I'm white and I have a bulb-ish haircut. I'm wearing glasses and a striped shirt. I have a light gray wall and a white curtains at the background. I'm currently working as a service designer at CAPD, uh, which is a professional body for people professionals. My work is about improvement of members' experience and organizational efficiency. So coming back to the event, we are recording and tweeting today. So please turn off your camera if you're not comfortable with that. You can find our latest event about collective change on our YouTube channel. For this event, we collaborated with Open Idea, London chapter, and we had speakers talking about their work on the vaccination booking services, about using blockchain tech to support farmers in developing countries through the pandemic. So you can find the recording from this event and other events on our YouTube channel. You can see the link now in the screen. So today we will have three speakers uh, whom I introduce in a minute. After every talk, we will have Q&A. So please use the chat to ask questions. And after every talk, uh, we will ask them and speaker will answer as many as possible. So let me introduce the first speaker. As a first speaker, speaker, we have Emily. She is the Climate Emergency Community Engagement Lead at Hammersmith and Fulham Council. From education and awareness to supporting community action, she works with residents, groups, and organizations to reduce carbon emissions and change behaviors in a fair way. With a background in service design and user research, Emily was previously at Future Gulf, where she worked to embed the climate crisis into the company mission. Emily, are you ready? Um, my name's Emily Sheher. I am a white woman with short bleach blonde hair, wearing a white shirt um, with some like hand-drawn little faces on it. And I'm here today to talk about um, the peaks, but mostly some of the pitfalls um, after a year of doing work in climate engagement. Strong topic and strong elements that you, that you brought up, and that was great. I'm going to pin you to the screen so we can see you, so you might see yourself. Um, but um, if anyone has any questions you want to drop them in the chat or you want to unmute yourself, it will take some minutes to, to go through them. Um, I'm, I feel that I'm still digesting some of the content that you shared and lots of thoughts and lots of different angles to it, both in terms of uh, context and um, 
adding some yeah pu putting putting situation into context and adding uh, mapping all the different elements to it as well as some of the consequences and yeah put, putting it in context in terms of what is happening in in this in this moment in this life and all the different elements are playing a role into it as well as some long term consequences unless anyone has a, any question i might have a question or maybe any speakers or someone i can see a hands up joshua hello joshua here he him i have big black window behind me wearing orange um yeah i have a very similar project that i'm doing at the moment so it's super relevant uh talk um i was wondering on your point around um focusing on whose behavior you want to change um how do you go about reaching those people? Because in some ways I feel maybe this is just an assumption, but the ones who have the highest carbon footprint are maybe the hardest to reach with this kind of communication. So I'm wondering if like you were to do the project again, what would be some approaches or tactics you would go about in reaching those people? Yeah. I'm, I honestly don't, don't know, Joshua. <laughs> like I, would welcome everyone's ideas in in the chat here. I, I think there's a few like locally, there's a few different groups, um, particularly kind of cultural and heritage groups around like older buildings. I think that are a really good that like buildings are the biggest source of carbon emissions in 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 the borough. So I think if we can work with them and the networks and residents that they work with, then that would be a really good good into some some like higher income households um, in particular areas. But yeah, like would throw it open to the group, I guess. How how could we engage um, underrepresented groups with higher carbon lifestyles? Great. I feel that there are also other comments for you in the chat, even if you want to pick them up later. Yeah. But lots of lots of great, I think, food for thoughts and inputs for um, for all of us, and also questions back to to all of us. So that's great. Um, I think. I think we are time, it's time now to move to the next speaker. But again, if there are any other questions can come through the chat, you can also just drop in, drop in there. And I think that Emily also share her contact details in case you want to reach out to her directly. But thank you so much, Emily. And our next speaker will be very interesting as well. It's Ali. She is a product designer and artist living in Vancouver, Canada. So it's money for her. She is the director of design at Numinous, where they deliver psychedelic assisted therapy to help people heal from several mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, addiction, and PTSD. Previously, she was head of digital at Snook and she co-founded Pivotal Act, an initiative within VMware focused on helping nonprofit design, design and build technology. Ali, could you introduce yourself, please? And then you can share your screen. Amazing, thank you everyone. Um, and that was a, a great talk before. I hope I can be as concise. Um, that will be my challenge. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, so yeah, I'm Ali. I am a white woman. I have long blonde hair. I'm wearing a blue t-shirt. I have some artwork hanging in the, in the back. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited to be here. Um, I recently moved from, from London um, to Vancouver, so I feel like I'm kind of connected being here with you all virtually. Um, and something before I jump in that I'm working on is my land acknowledgement. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the ancestral and unceded homelands of Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Just wanted to start with that. Um, I've already had the, the introduction, so I'm working on designing services um, around mental health using psychedelics. Um, so when I say psychedelics, I'm talking about ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin to help people with a number of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, things like that. So this is um, a, new, a new role for me. It's really exciting, a new space to be in. Um, I've been in design my entire career, mostly in technology. And um, I often hear people say, um, because it's designed, it is better. 
Um, but I think as we just heard, um, design also creates some problems and sometimes we can go in with, a, with good intentions and not understand the implications of our work because everything has a cause and effect and design isn't neutral. So I wanna kind of start off by just going through the cost of bad design and then talk about some of the tools and mindsets we can use to reframe things and understand the wider system. So um, what is the, the cost of, of bad design? Here, I'm not talking about unusable products or dark patterns on websites. I'm talking about choices, design choices that have led to systemic or societal impacts. And I think a really good example of this is the Olympic Games, which is happening right now. Um, if we think back to the Olympics in, in Rio, it cost about 13 billion and was promised all sorts of benefits for Brazil and, and its residents. And it had massive societal impacts. And, and this is, you know, keep in mind at a time when the government could barely afford wages for doctors and teachers and families were pushed out of their homes to make way for these Olympic facilities. And so few hosting cities have been able to maintain them. For example, Athens couldn't pay the electricity bill just six months after the game. So there's massive um, consequences to, to the Olympics itself. And if we kind of take a step back and, and map it out, the Olympics are designed and constructed by a lot of different actors, communities, companies, governments, um, and they promise increased tourism, revenue, um, but it isn't sustainable growth and the lack of long-term and systemic planning as we've seen in Rio and in Greece leads to the depletion of natural resources, environmental destruction. It's often built on, on cheap labor. There's inequality and violation of human rights. And in Greece, the Olympics contributed to a decade long depression, all of which is um, leading to a decline in tourism and revenue, which is exactly the opposite of what the Olympics prides itself on. And I think this is an oversimplified diagram, but the, really the point is to understand the larger implications and, and really understanding those wider systemic impacts. Because there are going to be these knock-on impacts and the rebound effect, as we were just talking about, and there are going to be impacts on the environment, on people, new regulations, policies. And I'm really interested in how, when we're exploring designing products and services, really thinking about the questions that are asked, when they're asked and how we unpack a problem. And so a good example of this, um, I think is the blind men and the elephant. Perhaps some of you have seen this painting before and other kind of variations of it. Um, the moral of the parable is that humans tend to claim absolute truth based on their very limited and subjective experience. So everyone is seeing a more complex reality in this painting. And I think that this is often happening in design and for being really critical um, because of the design tools that we use to, to design new solutions. And I think even the concept of designing solutions is it's problematic, but I won't get into, into that. But I think there's often an over-reliance on methods like Agile, Lean UX, Design Sprints, um, and it leads to a lot of short-term thinking rather than understanding that long-term impact and thinking about the broader system. So what does it mean to think in, in systems, just as a, a bit of, of framing? Um, a system is a set of interconnected things which can be made up of actors, tasks, relationships, channels, structures, um, and systems are things we're, we're designing in every day, financial, weather, healthcare, education, transportation. And we can't really understand a system until we understand all of the parts, the sum of the parts, like we saw in that painting. And I think problems shift based on our perspective as, as well. And complexity often increases at different scales. So this is a a small systems map that we were using when working with the Red Cross and thinking about the interactions between systems. And we have to look at the cause and effect. So if we're looking at something around shelter, we have to see how that's connected to overcrowding, homelessness, migration, and everything is, is connected. And we fall into a trap when we're looking at things in isolation or just that one individual part. A really good model, um, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before, the iceberg model by Danella Meadows, who's an environmental scientist, an amazing 
systems thinker and I think this is a really helpful framing to really think about are we addressing kind of surface level issues at the top of the iceberg just really responding to some of the events that are happening kind of like crisis response really quick um, what what is happening or are we starting to look at the trends and patterns the structures and the mental models and really getting to some of those root causes and as you move further down that's where the levers of change can start to happen so in, just in terms of some questions to, to think about that I try to keep um, at the top of my mind and working with multidisciplinary teams is really thinking about how the problem shifts. So if you're thinking about what that looks like for an individual, for a family, for a community, city, nation, every time you scale up, it, the problem is going to look different. And it's not to say that we're going to understand what that looks like on every different scale completely, because that would be an endless task. But we we need to think about how the problem shifts. Um, and as already uh, was just mentioned, um, we really need to think about um, what has been done already, uh, what worked, what didn't work. Um, it's super easy to go in and design something new and shiny, as we were just talking about. But how can we leverage what, what was already existing? How can we contribute to existing community initiatives rather than creating something new? And I just want to share a few examples as well. So this is um, a project that I was working on with um, the Collaborative Cash Delivery Network, which is a consortium of 15 NGOs, and they're delivering cash aid in emergency response, which if you're not familiar with cash aid, it's just an alternative form of aid. You can give resources like food or stuff like that, or you can give people cash. Um, and we were looking at that primarily emergencies within, within Kenya. And one of the things that the NGOs um, talked a lot about as we were understanding the problem is that they gave this example of the earthquake in Nepal in 2015. And they said the first response meeting had about 80 different people from across the humanitarian and private sector. And everyone wanted to get involved and to help, but there wasn't a clear way to collaborate. There was a lot of duplication of work, a lot of the same proposals um, going for, for funding were coming in and there was just a lot of duplication and there wasn't a safe way to share information. And so they were looking at ways technology might assist um, and, and help them better collaborate. And I remember so clearly when someone looked at me and they're like, we just need a dashboard to, to visualize all of this information. And perhaps um, I've heard this far too many times, but I'm, I'm not convinced that dashboards solve um, problems. I think perhaps in some cases they, they might, but often it's just looking at the surface level and it's hard to interpret that information um, and really what is happening as a result. And so what we started to do is look at what are the implications of designing a tool like this? How can we really think about the root causes? And so what we did is we started to map out what that system looks like and very messy process. I think often you see nice causal loop diagrams when you're thinking about systems thinking and they come in all shapes and sizes and ways to involve other people that might not come from a technical background is really important. So what we were thinking of was everything from a flash flood to forming a collaboration to thinking about the tools that different NGOs use to collect information around assessments, local markets, because it can be quite disruptive to bring in cash aid in some instances. You really want to think about those larger effects. And so we just started bringing all of these people together and then started to put in like what if prompts, what, what might happen so that we could anticipate some potential futures, thinking about if one NGO has more private presence in one country, thinking about feedback, if they're using different tools, and one of the, the, the things that came up was what if the if data is accessed by the wrong people? For example, if a terrorist organization like Al-Shabaab in Somalia got access to lists of people that are receiving cash aid, then their physical safety could be in danger. And it's just taking a step back and thinking through some of these prompts really helped us think through some of those negative implications. And we ended up designing a tool that really helps facilitate collaboration rather than just kind of visualizing what that might look like and thinking through how to do some of that scenario planning before a response. 
And all of this is um, prioritizing slowing down, uh, making space for reflection, thinking um, through what we're trying to achieve. Um, I think sometimes design sprints sometimes act as a checklist rather than a, a guide or you kind of follow the, the steps, but it's not, it's, it's messy, it's really complicated. And I think sometimes that can create more harm. Um, when just slowing down and asking some of those critical questions can really change the course for, for your work. So some questions to, to think about is, in terms of anticipating negative consequences, how will we avoid perpetuating the very problems we're, we're trying to address? Think about who will benefit and who will bear the cost of this product or service. I think we often think about, you know, the happy, the happy path, um, but who, who will carry that cost? Not only people, but environmental, just thinking about costs on various different levels. And then who is accountable when something goes wrong? Um, so just really thinking through that piece as well. And I know I'm probably coming close to time. I'll give a few more quick examples um, of different tools you could use. Um, one is a, a future wheel, which um, I believe was created in the 70s. So super old tool that helps you think about the ethical trade-offs. Um, and the way to use it is you put the solution or the problem in the center, and then you think about the first order and second order consequences as a result of putting that solution into the world and how to use that. And I, we actually use this with social finance based out of the UK, thinking about supporting young people as a transition out of care and thinking about how um, a tool could better help young people and their support person transition through that process. And a lot of the things we were thinking about was around collecting data to better design these services for, for young people. And there are consequences to that. Um, we were all aware of the consequences of, of collecting information, what you're going to do with that information. But for us, it was looking at designing a tool that could determine how well or how poorly a young person was doing when it's just not that binary. And so what we did was we brought all the stakeholders together. We thought through some of those different features and really thought about those unintended consequences of, of releasing it and putting it into the world. The last example I'll give is um, working with A21, which is an anti-human trafficking nonprofit based in the US. Um, and we were working with them around bringing their curriculum for educators online. Uh, it was all taught um, in classrooms and they were looking at ways to help teach students about the early warning signs of human trafficking. And similar to the, to the future wheel and really understanding and framing the, the problem, we use the classic five whys, which I know is an old one, but it is really, really helpful if you take the time to really step th through why are we doing this? Why is this a problem that teachers lack the confidence to teach such a sensitive topic? How can we make sure that we're thinking through all of those, those challenges for them and some of those, those barriers and root causes? And um, I think sometimes the old tools, you can bring them back and they can really help frame, frame the work in a positive way. And that's, this was something that was super helpful for, for, that, for that piece of work. Um, so just a few final questions or kind of prompts um, it, around problem framing and intended impact is just thinking about who's framing the problem, um, who is the problem centered around. They hold a lot of power and it's important to, to acknowledge that. What evidence has been collected to define the problem? Um, thinking about, you know, if that data was um, collected in a, in a way that um, just thinking about biases behind data sets, what data sets we're using to inform uh, decision making. And then lastly, why is there a need to, to intervene? Thinking about like, are we best placed to do that? And I'll end on this quote um, by the co-founders of Project Inkblot. Um, their good intentions is not impact. So your good intentions and cultural defaults could harm others. And taking the time to critically reflect and think about the unintended consequences can help us, I think, make more meaningful, oh, my screen just died, perfect timing, um, more meaningful and impactful design um, choices. So I have a few resources I could share if you're interested in learning more about some of these topics, but I'm definitely over time, so I'll stop now. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you, Ali, that was great.
and a round of virtual virtual applause. I'm not sure what I'm not even clapping myself, but that was great. Uh, very comprehensive and again a different perspective to the topic. So that was super interesting. Pin yourself so you'll see yourself. It is a bit weird, but um, I think lots of elements to it. I can see there are also some. Uh, comments in the chat and it would be great if you could share the books and the links into the chat so that people can have access to that also reminders that we will share the recording in case you want to go back to any of these I took some screenshots myself as well because I was there are also some sentences that really resonated with me I can see in the comments as well in terms of like slowing down or asking what if type of thing uh, also some comments about loving the system thinking and how important it is to map that intended and unintended consequences. Uh, there is one question that is about, and I'm reading it loud, loud now, um, would it be interesting to know how, when you identify potential intended consequences, how you feed that back into the loop if you're using rapid design methods? If you're using what, what sorry, what was the last piece of it? if you're using rapid design methods. So that uh, idea, I guess, of slowing rapid. down and fitting back. Yeah, how do you feed that in? I think it all comes to the very um, initial stages of any piece of work that you're engaging in and really setting that tone and expectations from the get-go. I think often you can spend a lot of time understanding and unpacking the system and the problem at the very beginning, but then it stops. And then there's no coming back to understanding the problem. What have we learned? How has the, the system changed since we started working on this as well? And so I think if possible, I know this is difficult given probably various different ways people are engaging in, in these types of projects to, to shift how the project or the piece of work, um, if you're in-house or whatever kind of situation you may find yourself in, it can be hard to shape how it's structured, but I think it's absolutely essential because if it's just all design sprints from start to finish, it's gonna be really difficult to make that time. So if it is design sprint based, I would tr try to make space for critical for reflection, reflection at the end of each week, or just to make sure you hold space and you bring in non-team members as well into that conversation so that you're sharing out those learnings with, with other folks as well. Great, that continues loop and, and reflection. Um, well, we're running a little bit out of time, but I wanted to yeah. just uh, ask one more question. And then if there are more questions in the chat, if it's okay for you to reply to some of them directly in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's one question about how do you go about defining who is best suited to intervene and take action? Oh, yeah, that's such a meaty question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, that is, a, that is a big one. It really depends on the, the, the space. Um, and I think it comes back to leveraging um, or, or working with co different community initiatives that are already um, in place, um, or if you're not working at the community level, just thinking about what has happened prior to you working on this, because it's not the first time this problem has been tackled. And I think often we're like, we're the first ones to address that, but it's like absolutely not the case. And so I think when defining who's best placed, it's looking at all of the actors that have already been involved, learning from that, and then looking at ways to collaborate um, and bring all of those people in, if, if possible, or at least bringing them in at, at certain points along in that, in that journey. But I think it's just actively reflecting on your role as well in that and just challenging your own biases and, and how you're showing up and what you're putting into the world. That's great. Thank you so much, Charlie. I think you added even more layers for reflections and rethinking about how we, we go about with our projects and, and processes. That was great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sally. And round of applause, virtual applause for you as well. Our next speaker don't have a design word in a title as well which is very good. So Arthur is a housing needs team manager at Hackney Council. In his day-to-day -day role, he oversees the work of over 40 housing needs officers in a small immediate management team. The benefits and housing needs service supports nearly 4,000 homeless households each year. And out of these 70% are single homeless applicants. So Arthur, could you please introduce yourself and start presenting. Thank you. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. I, uh, I'm Arto. Um, my pronouns he, him. Um, and whatever hair I have left um, is rough, uh, light brown color. Um, I have a stripy white and light green shirt on, and I sit in a quite a colorful room with some rosy pink walls, some artwork, and you may just about see my uh, pet dog, Bebe, in a corner. He's a, a white and light brown Jack Russell cross. So as mentioned, um, I work for Hackney Council uh, within the homelessness team, and I have had the pleasure, or the council have, we've had the uh, pleasure of working with FutureGov, who's, who's Who's, who's been working with the council for several years now on, on improving some of our mainly back office systems and processes so we can then free up more space, um, more time for our officers to do really meaningful work with our homeless applicants. Um, and a lot of the uh, applicants, uh, particularly the single homeless applicants that present um, at the council, come with uh, uh, multiple complex support needs. So on a, at the last count, I think we looked at um, and roughly about 20% of the single approaches now come with multiple complex support needs, um, which is obviously having a strain on the service um, and our officers kind of the, the, the quality of work, but also impact on their well well-being. Um, and uh, FutureGov has worked on several different projects with us now, but um, one of the projects that I was involved was looking at how can we collate better information, particularly on individuals being released from prison um, and or uh, being discharged from uh, hospitals um, and primarily from the mental health side. So we really started from scratch. And if I share you... Um, the next slide, which is just to give you an overview of our service vision for the service. So we've kind of created a tube map where you have uh, the, the ginger line um, and you have the Victoria and Pic Piccadilly line. And how those have been designed is that the ginger line uh, applicants are usually people that have quite a lot of abilities, skills. Um, they can do a lot of the things independently, so they can use internet, they can um, um, contact landlords, they can you know, um, go on viewings unaccompanied, um, and a lot of the things they can just do as long as we give them the tools how to do that. And then the, the bottom two lines, uh, where you have the, the light blue and the darker blue lines, that's where the complexity of the support needs um, increases, um, which is what Future Gov's work has been a lot geared towards. Um, and alongside with the, a few of us from the service, we've been working on numerous different tools, how we can support our residents better, um, but also um, ensure that our officers and staff well-being is looked after. So one of the things I wanted to just touch on before we go any further, before I run through uh, some of the service uh, design work that has we've, we've done, is looking at trauma. So uh, particularly over the last two, two years, I think uh, everyone has been affected by some level of trauma. But uh, even even when we grew up, we probably experienced trauma of, 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 of different kinds or when we grew up. Now, a lot of the homeless applicants, the ones which, which are within the 20% of the applicants, will, ha will come with bags of trauma. So multiple different traumatic experiences. And when you layer that then with other support needs, such as drug and alcohol, mental health, uh, domestic abuse, all of those combined will then start to uh, create uh, challenges on on how, on on how we best support them and what is the best possible outcome for the individual as they progress uh, through the service. So when FutureGov uh, started working with our referral form and how we can improve um, the uh, quality of referrals that we were getting, but more more so uh, the information that we needed um, to safely make placements for individuals that potentially had, you know, multiple failed placements um, in the past, um, you know, the, the antisocial behavior, mental health breakdowns, um, etc. Um, and we started from a very badly designed form. And 
it, it may not look like on the screen, um, like it was very poorly designed, but actually the formatting, the look of the form um, and how easy it was to use was really not good. So we started with a very basic form and quite soon after we kind of looked at the design, um, we then came up with a much better and improved design only to, you know, changing the font, but also uh, gi giving better um, instructions for the individ uh, the staff professionals who were completing the referral um, and really having an emphasis on what support will be in place when we make a placement. So often that ends up being temp recommendation um, and temp recommendation uh, is unstaffed. So you have security and you have the hostel management team who go in and you have caretakers, but you don't have support staff on site. So we really wanted to improve the level of detail and um, uh, I suppose in many ways safety and the support network that was in place and the risk management um, was in place when we made placements. And, and just by involving our colleagues within the prison and probation system and also um, health staff, um, health professionals um, and our, our own staff uh, developing a form, we came up with a really user-friendly uh, form, which has made a massive difference um, um, in the way that uh, the level of detail we now get from whoever sends the referral to us ha has greatly improved. And our temp, temp recommendation staff are having less issues with residents because they know who to go to if there's any signs of perhaps mental health relapse or um, you know, sometimes um, behavior changes. Um, they, 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 they know who they can contact to get some additional support. So then, that was great. Thank you for Future Cup for that. Um, the involvement design work, you know, I'm not the best at designing things. Um, and as, as mentioned, I don't come from design background. But um, towards the end of last year, I kind of accidentally ended up with a task. And, and I say accidentally, um, we uh, are partners in a, a new project which um, started last year, Home Office funded project with aim to reduce drug related deaths in the borough. And um, uh, the cohort um, have uh, some level of drug and alcohol uh, misuse um, and also contact with the criminal justice system. So there's number of partners, but I think on the last count, we have about 12 different partners within the partnership. And actually, we regularly met and kept talking about how can we best share information and how can we all be aware that when someone's, someone is being released from prison and how, does, how do we share that information effectively so we then avoid re-traumatizing our clients um, by having you know, sending a referral to another service and then the, the client goes into another service and the, the service will then ask the same questions all over and over and over again. But as, as we've had just gone through the exercise of redesigning our referral form, I then um, used the same template, um, so stolen the design, and that, that was my kind of starting point. And I like when Ali said that, you know, sometimes you just have to use what's working well and not to start re, re -invent, reinventing something that um, totally brand new. So I used the template and involved all our partners, initially got all of the, their um, assessment forms really to get an understanding that are we really, uh, are we all asking the same questions? Because that was the general sense. And I think, you know, the experience working in different services and different, you know, industries, when you are talking to vulnerable clients or clients, you tend to ask the same type of questions, which then just means that we could, in a sense, bring um, all the assessment forms into one and create a one that we can then easily share with the consent of the individual, with the relevant services, with the information that they would be asking. So then when they when they engage with the service, they, they we don't have to ask those difficult, uncomfortable, quite traumatic questions again, which will then create anxiety, you know, behavior issues, violence, um, withdrawal from services because um, they, they're just getting fed up ask, being asked about the same questions over and over again. So we didn't stop there, we carried on. So we've improved in terms of tailored the form um, and created the assess assessment form, which really covers 
uh, all the different areas that all the services wanted, um, i.e., you know, there, there was the housing aspect, obviously finance management, any offending risk, um, and what support and risk management was going to be in place. Um, and alongside with the form, we used, used useful prompts. So really trying to look at both ways. So how the main aim was obviously trying to prevent from re-traumatizing our clients by asking the same questions again, but also looking at that we uh, staff turnover, but also uh, some staff are more confident asking about questions of, uh, about certain support needs, but also the understanding of what services are out there and what how, how what what level of support that the, the individual might gain by accessing the service so we've used prompts just to um remind the the the, the whoever's the assessing individual to to really ask the questions and then explore whether another service should also be involved and just to help the um the, the kind of confidence level, we also um, embedded um, direct links to the form, which will then take the individual, so that the professional can click on a link and it takes straight, that takes them straight to the website, um, to the section what the service does. So that's really, I suppose, in many ways, whether it's the unintended result, result or intended result, it, I, the ask was different initially, and we kind of got a a good result out of that and then the form has the design template has then evolved and become became something uh, bigger so as i mentioned we now have about 12 partners who's already signed up to the common assessment tool and the initial fee feedback is going really well so the next step the next step for us is to really uh, work with our clients as well and ask their feedback how they're finding, are, 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 have we made a difference? Has it, have we improved the quality of service, but also the unnecessary questioning over and over and over again? So we should hopefully in a couple of months have a bit more data on, on that. Um, and as, you know, hopefully, you know, if everything goes well, we'd like to get this rolled out to all of our partners, all of our local partners in the area. So hopefully we'll get buy-in from all the different partners that we work with. And I believe that was all from me. That's great. Thank you, Arto. It was like a, another, an, again, another angle today's and feels like there are certain elements that are coming up uh, again and again tonight. And it's interesting to see both in terms of unintended consequences, but also some like solutions and thinking practically about what it can be done as, for example, the whole idea of leveraging in community initiatives and that idea of like connecting with all the other partners around uh, and it was great also to have a specific example and some of the learnings out of it. There are a couple of comments uh, and plus one to some of the things that you were saying. And one comment about, let me see if I found it again. Yes. Um, about how exciting it is to, to see some of the work and if the simple tool can also make a, an inference. But the question is about trauma and is about do you make any prevention plans or work with residents to identify early signals and strategies to stay well? Well, I'm glad that that question got asked because actually one of the tools that we did develop with um, with the support from FutureGov was we've also, uh, there's a couple of other tools, but one of the tools that we've developed is a resilient chat tool, which is basically working with the, so alongside with you know the, the the trauma informed assessment we also use something called resilience chat tool which we really try and get our uh, residents to kind of acknowledge and recognize their own trigger points so give you an example if there's a pattern of someone I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll place them into interim and every time that placement fails because of antisocial behavior, that they're being, you know, threatening towards staff or, you know, potentially other residents. So it's really uh, asking the right kind of questions that what's making them beha behave in that way. So you, we can kind of use the past history that we have available already as part of the conversation. So, oh, so it looks like the last few times that you've been in placements, every time it's ended because of antisocial behavior. And can you tell me a little bit more about why those things happened? And as they then talk, you're kind of using your active listening skills. Um, and then you kind of get to the nitty gritty. And it might be just as simple as, you know, 
um, every time there's been some kind of an incident where there's been lots of other residents around, lots of shouting, and that's got their anxiety levels up. So it's really then working out that, okay, well, how could you prevent that same thing from happening this time around when we place you somewhere? Is it, tell me what's, what's the kind of thing that you would normally do when you get angry? What diffuses that situation? So it might just be oh yeah, that's true, I just need to go for a walk or I need to go out for five minutes and have a cigarette. So it's just really trying to work with the residents and it's kind of planting the seed. So every time you meet with them, you have the similar kind of conversation, kind of like, oh, has there been any, any incidences recently? You know, how did you manage that? It sounds like you've done really well. And over time, the, the resident will start to kind of go like, actually, what, what the discussion that we've been having, it's really making me think differently, but also me thinking differently, I'm reacting and uh, to situations differently. Hopefully that answered your question. I, th I think it did. And I can see some more positive comments coming your way. And again, it was it was great to see like a specific example as well, that element of trauma and like the possible harms that some of the design can can cause or like reframing some of the questions that they can can it can have um i can see that we're already running out of time so we'll pause here thank you so much for another another round of applause if we didn't do it for you that was that was great and uh, i think that we are at the end of our evening we're going to close with just a recap and some thank you and then we're going to all go off to our our lives our dinners uh, but thank you again to all the speakers and all the people there also to take some time to come tonight yeah a massive round of applause for emily ali and arto and uh, just a quick summary of some of the brilliant things that we've heard today just in case you didn't manage to catch all of it so from emily we had some really great learnings about how best to get people involved and things around not using alarmist language the ladder of participation really stood out as a great tool for people to be using and some really key learnings about connecting up what's already in the community. I think that's been a really common thread that we've seen through quite a lot of these talks today. The rebound effect, uh, those unintended consequences of maybe trying to save carbon in one place, but it might end up building up in another. Uh, so thanks again, Emily. It's a pleasure to have you. From Ali, we heard things around the societal impacts of the Olympics, the fact that so many facilities are often not maintained, and all of those kind of knock-on impacts that can happen afterwards. We learned a bit more about kind of systems thinking using the iceberg model, which I highly recommend everyone kind of checks out and uses, um, and using these maybe these what-if prompts to make sure that we're thinking about those intended and unintended consequences as we go through a project. So thanks again, Ali. And from Arto, uh, we heard lots about ensuring that you're being kind of trauma informed, making sure you aren't asking the same information multiple times. I know that definitely resonates with quite a lot of services and that it can be re-traumatizing people. And there was something really uh, key around uncovering those real needs and creating further intended consequences by really understanding those unintended ones throughout a project. So thanks again for everyone for joining us. Um, if you want to give a talk or want to recommend someone for a talk in the future, please do reach out, uh, DM us at Service Lab London. Uh, the video from today will be shared and edited and be out on YouTube in a couple of weeks. Please keep an eye out for our next event. Um, and we're also looking for more co-organizers to be involved in the future. So please let us know if you're interested. But bye from us for now and see you again soon.